Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Dr. Evan Osar coming to you on a beautiful Saturday morning. This is October 10th, I believe. Welcome wherever you are. I am Dr. Evan Osar, one of the two anatomy geeks. I'm super excited to be joined by my fellow anatomy geek, Jill Leary. What's up? You got your high mug five. High five, virtual high five. Awesome. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary's Mary. here. Mary's on. She is in Michigan. Chicago is in. I mean, Chicago. <laughs> Jill is in <laughs> Chicago. Chicago is in the house. And uh, we, we are coming to you live from Wisconsin. So, so we're, we're representing the Midwest here. Mm -hmm. at Julianne McGrady, how are you? Our good friend down in Florida is representing the Southwest or Southeast, I should say. South, very far Southeast. Welcome, welcome. I'm sure it's warm and beautiful down there in Florida. Welcome wherever you are coming to us live. While we're getting started, we're going live on Facebook. I should say we are currently live on Facebook. So thank you. Hang on just a second. <laughs> I'll be the filler. Welcome everybody. Uh, super excited to be here. And oh, I think we have Dr. Osar back. I think he's back. So wherever you're coming to us from, let us know in the chat. Just put down in the chat where you're coming from. If you are, if you are in Facebook, <laughs> I'm getting claps from, from the boss in the back there. <laughs> so we're all good. We're on Facebook Live. So we are up in Wisconsin. We do, we do obviously have internet connection and <laughs> capabilities. Very good. Hey, Knoxville, Tennessee. Karen, awesome. Welcome. That's awesome. San Diego, Marcia, it's real early out there. So thank you for Brazil. joining. Brazil. Brazil, Brazil in the house, Toronto. Hey, we're representing all across the country. Awesome, welcome, Jacqueline. That's fantastic. Maybe we'll get some Scotch Plains, New Jersey. I'm from Jersey, not too far from Scotch Plains. My good buddy, my good buddy, actually has a gym there. Awesome, welcome, welcome. Keep, keep letting us know where you're from as we get started here. Jill and I are super excited to be back for our fall series. Harold, hey, how are you, Harold? Where are you from, Harold? Who's your buddy in Scotch Plains? My buddy, hold on, hold on. Uh, ben in, he, he's in Scotch Plains, but he, he owns a gym down there. Beautiful downtown Chicago. Hey, Suzanne, who are you? Thanks for coming to us from Chicago. Uh, yes, so we are super excited to be back for our fall series promo. This is a free training. We're planning for it to go 30 minutes. However, you know what happens when Jill and I get together. It's hard to wrangle us in for 30 minutes so we'll see how we'll see if we can get, get, get done by, by uh 9 30 here however if we go a little bit longer i'm sure you guys will be okay with that because we, our goal we have really one goal one priority to do these trainings number one we want you to learn anatomy we'll describe and discuss why that is so important and we want to share with you also how this anatomy this is really why we, we created this series you know, we're sort of, it started out as like sort of a goof of the two of us just being on Facebook Live when we were still in the office together. But during quarantine, obviously, we couldn't be together. So we're like, hey, how do we get this information out to individuals who want to learn anatomy? And, you know, hey, Gina, how are you from Massachusetts? Uh, so one of the things that my wife has been telling me to do for years, she's like, people are asking about anatomy. I'm like, no, people know anatomy. It's all good. But then I realized, like, holy cow, you know more and more people were asking us for anatomy. They're like, where can we go for anatomy to find good information about anatomy? So uh, we would try to send them to, send to resource, resources that were effective and good, but we, but we just couldn't find one that taught anatomy the way we felt anatomy should be taught and learned, the way we wanted to learn it as students. So Jill and I just started goofing around on Facebook Live well, when we were together and, and people really, really enjoyed the series. And that's basically where Two Anatomy Geeks came from. And, and now it's a... Um, you know, it's, it's been a, we've done three series. We did shoulder, we did core, and we did hips. So when you purchase any, yeah. any two of the series, so if you, if you buy the, the series that are already done, core and, and hips, you get the shoulder for free. So, and we'll also invite you to purchase and enroll in our upcoming program coming up here in a few, just starting in a few short weeks. So thank you for wherever, you're, wherever you are from. Again, I'm Dr. Evan Osa. I'm a chiropractic physician. I work with my wife in Chicago, Illinois. And way back when, in 1999, I, when I started as a chiropractic physician, physician, I got a job teaching at a massage therapy school called Soma Clinical School of Clinical Massage or something like that. Uh, Soma National School of Clinical Massage <laughs> Therapy. <laughs> that school right there. So it's, it's, it's so crazy that 
you know, so many influential or, or people instrumental in my own life came from that school because I met my, the guy that hired me is my good friend, physical therapist at Flaherty. He became a dear friend of ours, my wife and, and mine. And he gave me the job and the opportunity there. And in the second class I taught was this girl, Jill. And I was like, Jill, she's a great student and smart, respectful. And little did I know that 20 years later that she, she would come to work in our office before quarantine. So it was a great honor to have Jill. Jill became one of my wife's best friends. So my, I met my wife also at the same school and she met her three closest friends at the school. So, and we were all teachers there at the school at one time, or I should say all four of us, five of, I guess five of us, the four yeah. of you and myself, we were all teaching there at, at, at one time. So this school was, was instrumental in bringing us together with some really great people. So Jill, if you want to introduce yourself and uh, tell them about your background, because you, now you're back teaching at SOMA. Yes. So sorry, when you guys see me like looking at something else, I'm just kind of answering some stuff that's coming through in terms of the chat and Q&A and stuff, just welcoming people. So um, hey, my name is Jill Leary. I am a licensed massage therapist. Uh, I have been working for 20 years as a licensed massage therapist, and I have also been teaching um, sciences, including anatomy, for the past 20 years. So um, here in Chicago, I also lived a little bit in um, Des Moines, Iowa, if we have anybody from Iowa on the chat right now. But uh, so I was teaching there as well. And yes, I've known Dr. Osar and Janice um, for a very long time. So I've also gotten to know what they do and, and also know even more over the past, um, gosh, almost year um, with working with them, um, what they do. And um, I love it. And I'm so happy to you know, quarantine and every, well, everything that's going on has a silver lining. Um, if you look at it, you know, in some aspects, not in all, of course, but man, I'll tell you, this wouldn't have come about if it wouldn't have been what's happened this year. Right. So always trying to look at the, the bright side of things when you can. And this has been really fun. And it feels like going back to school, like it's kind of fall. <laughs> right. And I feel like, you know, I need to put on my new clothes for my first day of school <laughs> back is how it felt this morning. I was all excited. So glad to yep. be here. Awesome. Great to have you. Great to be partnered with you for the series. Because we want to make this an interactive series, I mean, you should say session, Grab yourself something so that you can use it on your foot. So I'm going to use the activator by my friends over at Rolga. So Rusty and Dana over at Rolga. Activator, I'm going to use this. However, it's black and my socks that I'm wearing are actually black. Actually, I may take my socks off so that way you can see it easier on that. However, also, if you don't have that, that's fine too. Use a ball, just a regular lacrosse ball. You can even use a tennis ball because we're going to teach you how to work your plantar fascia. And there's other, you know, I have this other device. I don't even know where I got it, but this work, this will work okay. But I'd rather have you have like a round ball because that way, you know, we talk a lot about how we don't have people just mindlessly just roll their foot like this, but we're going to do some rolling, specific rolling on the foot and to, to work specifically the plantar fascia. So without further ado, thank you again for joining us. We got quite a few individuals on live and hopefully many people, more people will be watching this, the recording of this. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to get started. We're going to do a little bit of tutorial and we'll do a little practical hands-on because one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that this information is applicable to you and your clients, especially the general population clients that most of you work with, just like we do here in our clinic, or I should say in our clinic in Chicago. So let me share my screen. Jill, just give me a thumbs up when you see my screen, just to make sure everybody can access it and see it. Yep. All right, let's get started. So we, we are the two anatomy geeks. Welcome again, Dr. Evan Osar and Jill Leary, licensed massage therapist. So we are your guides for this free training. Thank you so much for being on. I want to share, share a story of a client that came into me years ago. And one of the things that I always want to do, and it was always important to me, is that I always stay in practice. And obviously during quarantine, we're still in practice because we can stay open as an essential business. However, it's, it's always important to me, regardless of where my life takes me and my journeys take me, that I always keep my hands on clients. Because if you're not seeing clients actively, you know, if you're, if you're learning from people that aren't currently seeing clients, then they're only teaching you what they know used to work. And it can be very effective. There's nothing wrong with that. You want to learn from past experiences. However, you're not progressing your information because you're not 
in front of people. So one of the things that I have dedicated myself to doing is always staying in front of people. So I continually challenge the information and, and the education that I've gotten through my 30 years of, you know, between being in the field and education. So I learned a lot from this one patient that came in years ago. Mary was referred to me by a chiropractor. It was her chiropractor's mother. Mary was a 62 year old teacher. She had chronic bilateral foot pain to the point where she was in physical therapy for basically an entire year. She had a surgery where they punched holes in her plantar fascia. She still had crazy pain in her feet where she couldn't, she was a teacher. So she couldn't teach her class standing on her feet, which when you're teaching little kids, you know, it's important. You got to be on your feet, right? You have to be active. And she couldn't stand on her feet because she was, it was so painful. Even after all this, this entire year of physical therapy and surgery, she wanted to walk to lose weight. She was, she was overweight and she wasn't able to walk. She had rested. Nothing seemed to work for her. So I applied some of the strategies I'll share with you here. And one of the things when, when you see a client, because many of you, again, are working with the general population like we are, and they've had a lot of things done. She had massage done on her foot. She had all the exercises done on her foot. Well, then it requires you to sort of think about what has she not had done to her? What have people not looked at with her? Now, this is not a course, this particular training is not on breathing. It's not on posture and alignment per se. But one of the things we looked at on Mary was her posture and breathing. Because if you don't hold good posture, good alignment, and you don't have good breathing, what breathing does, if you've been to our previous sessions, is breathing helps you create suspension. Let me stop this share screen just for a moment so you can see me again. What I want you to do as you're listening to this is stand up and feel your feet on the floor. Just get a sense of your feet on the floor. So please be active and do this, these exercises so you feel what's happening through your own body or in your own body as you're working through this information. So you kind of feel your feet on the floor. Feet together, hands by your side, just look straight ahead. Feel your feet on the floor. Feel where the pressure is. Is it on the inside, outside? Is it on the front, on the back? Is it different between two feet? Like for example, I can feel on my right foot, I have more of my contact underneath my, basically my entire foot. But on my left side, I'm a little bit more on the outside of my foot where there isn't as much pressure on the inside of my heel or my big toe. So just get a sense of that in your own feet. Okay, so my feet are a little bit different on each side. Now, what I want you to do is spread your feet out just a little tiny bit, not a huge amount, just a little tiny bit, and then just kind of let your body just sag. Let your belly sag, let your knees sag, and then, then feel what happens to your feet. Now I have more weight on the inside of both feet. Again, more on the inside of my right foot, but also on the inside of my left foot. And if you have, you'll notice, I should, should say, your arches also slightly fall down as well. So you feel more pressure down into your feet, and you feel more pressure inside that plantar fascia. You may not feel the plantar fascia specifically, but you probably feel a stretching out through your feet foot. Now, shake that out. Just shake your body out. Now, imagine, go with me with these visual, these cues, because cueing, how you cue your client is very important to what happens down at the foot. Now, feel as if you're being pulled up from the back side of your head, neck, and rib cage, as, as if you're being suspended towards the ceiling, almost like a puppet on puppet strings. Now, take a couple, couple deep breaths into your rib cage. So breathe all the way through your rib cage. And when I say rib cage and not belly is because belly breathing actually isn't 100% optimal breathing. In fact, it can actually perpetuate, create and perpetuate non-optimal strategies in your clients. So just breathe through your rib cage. So front to back, and that's really the key is send your breath front to back in your rib cage. Send your breath side to side through your rib cage. Now stay long and again, feel your feet now upon the floor. What do you notice with your feet compared to what happened when you collapse down? Your weight should be more evenly distributed across your foot. We'll talk about the foot tripod here in a little bit. And also think about how, your, how the pressure feels, like how much weight are you putting down in your feet? So again, now go back to what you did earlier. Let's just collapse down, allow the weight just to collapse down, your belly to sag, and you, you just slump down. And now suspend lengthen out through the back of your head and neck, lengthen out through your rib cage, breathe into your rib cage, front to back, side to side, as well as top to bottom. And now you should feel a much different feeling through your feet, much lighter feeling. 
And that's the importance that you can have a seat. Thank you for doing that with me. Now that's the importance of having optimal alignment above and basically being able to suspend your weight off your feet. And many of our clients, including my client, Mary, I'm going to go back to share screen so you can go back to the presentation. My client, Mary, she was someone who was collapsed down. She had, had been pregnant twice, once with twins and once with a solo um, pregnancy or, 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 yeah, pregnancy. And she had had C-sections with both sets of pregnancies or both pregnancies. And she had basically collapsed her entire body down into her feet. All her therapists, all her surgeons and doctors, all they looked at was her feet. It was important that we looked at her entire body. And that's, this, that's what I want to stress to you is, is the importance of understanding that how interconnected the body is. And if a client has foot problems, we can't just look at the foot. However, today, we're just going to look at the foot just because of time. And that's why we're going to invite you to further training with us at the end of this presentation. So take home message is when you think about the foot, don't forget what's happening through the rest of the body. Now, some of your clients also have knee problems that will also impact the foot. We'll talk about that and how that relates to the health of the plantar fascia as we go along as well. So the moral of the story of Mary is when you change your client's strategy, you can change your life. Because what's cool about this is Mary was able to, she came back the next week. She's like, hey, I was able to stand a little bit at school with a lot less discomfort. But the second week she came back, she's like, I'm able to actually walk a little bit now without discomfort. And by the time that she came, up, she came back for the third visit, she was actually walking with almost no pain. Now we had to build her back up. But again, this is someone that for an entire year couldn't walk, couldn't stand because of the chronic foot problems. And in three sessions, we were able to change that. And again, you will have miraculous cases like that and you'll have more stubborn cases. But when you understand that when you change your client strategy, you can change your life. That's truly a true statement. And I'll share with you more of that information as we go along here. Okay. So today we'll talk about the foot, most specifically the plantar fascia and a little bit of how the knee impacts the foot. Because again, we'll talk about the, the knee in a further series in this fall as well. Our goal, like I said, we want to develop specialists. We want you to be extraordinary. And I love this quote. I don't know who said it, so it's sort of my quote now. We are not born to do extraordinary things. We're born to do the ordinary things extraordinarily well. And that's what we want to train you to do. That's why we're so excited to share this information with you. Now, why do you need to know anatomy? Because a lot of people will say, they'll say, I don't need to know anatomy. That's just to impress your friends. Well, that's like saying a doctor needs to know anatomy and structure and function of your body just because he wants to impress his friends. No, no, no. Specialists know the foundation of why and what they're doing, of how the body works, so that they can create the most appropriate strategies for their clients. So it creates a foundation. It helps you understand how the body functions. It also gives you perspective. So when people share information with you, it allows you to have a perspective of, hey, does that information make sense based upon what we know about the fundamental function, structure, and function of the body? It helps you to de develop yourself as a specialist and differentiate yourself from the other individuals that are in the industry. And the one thing that, that Jill was speaking about is that you know, one of the silver lining linings that I believe will come out of COVID and is coming out of COVID is it will get rid of a lot of these stragglers that are, that are jumping on the fitness industry because they don't have anything else to do. Or they're like, Hey, I like working out. So I'm going to be a fitness specialist as well. And they just go down and they start training clients or they're training clients virtually. Like this is an opportunity for you to differentiate yourself in the industry as a specialist. That's why we're sharing this information with you. So why do you need to know anatomy? Another reason why is you can, so you can separate the myths from the facts. You want to base what you do on facts. Like I just posed a question on social media today on, on Instagram. Should you allow the knees to go forward or not when you're doing squats? And there's some myths around that and there's some facts around that. So if you understand anatomy and biomechanics, then you'll understand why this could be a myth and why this should this can also be a fact, but more importantly, what happens when you keep the knees behind your client's toes? Or what happens when you allow the knees to go forward as your client's squatting, lunging, and or doing functional exercises of the lower extremity? So it's important you also realize this is not medical advice. This is education so that you can help create the best strategies for your clients. Obviously, you, you have done your history and basically assessment, I should say your history and assessment so that you know what's specific to your client. However, this is, 
the information we're going to share with you is what we use with our clients, but it's not carte blanche for you just to go do it with your clients. It's only when it's appropriate and your client is medically cleared to exercise that you use this information. Okay. Now, Jill, if you wouldn't mind just jumping on, talk about the attachments because we hear things, terminology like origin, insertion. We talk about that also in Two Anatomy Geeks, but we also want to be re respectful of the, the attachments. What's the origin and what's the insertion and why is it more important to think about just muscle attachments or, or fascial attachments versus specific origin insertions? Well, um, I'm just going to go back to the basics of, you know, when you talk about what an origin and insertion is, um, when it was first named, origins had two things that um, they were named based off. You got to be an origin if you were usually closer to the body or usually the anchored part of the muscle on the, the bony landmark that the muscle was attaching to. Um, the insertion then was usually going to be the attachment of the muscle that was farther away from the body and was usually the movable part. Um, but what we learned, so let me just give you an example of the muscle we're going to talk about today. But if you look at soleus, um, the origin for soleus is going to be on this posterior aspect of the tibia and the fibula. And the insertion would be down here at the heel or the calcaneus. So, you know, it makes sense that when you think about, you know, one of the actions of the soleus, which is to plantar flex the ankle, um, that's kind of following the rules, right? The origin is closer to the body. It's the anchored part, all right? It's the part that's not moving. And the insertion is the part that's farther away from the body. And it is going to be the part that moves so that when the brain tells this muscle to contract concentrically, you're going to get that plantar flexion and the insertion moves closer to the origin. What's nice about talking about attachments is a more general term is that sometimes, as we learn in these webinar series, is that sometimes the origin comes closer to the insertion. Sometimes there's times when your client is doing things where you're not always just going to see, like in this case, the insertion always come closer to the origin. You might do things where you start to see possibly, you know, the origin start to come closer to the insertion. So that's why we like to use the word, the terms attachments. You might, because I'm sort of, you know, we'll still stick sometimes to origin insertion, but it's good to know where it came from, where that um, basis of everything was from. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Now, the other thing we'll talk about are the actions. Now, as Jill mentioned, actually, Jill, if you don't mind jumping on with this, mm -hmm. a lot of the actions have been described as what does the body do, which position does the body move into when that insertion moves closer to the origin? So can you, can you talk about that a little, little bit? So in terms of um, what for Dr. Osar, um, what positions does the body go into? Usually when we talk about, and this might be where you're going at with this, is um, usually when they're showing the actions, like when you look in an anatomy book, they're talking about um, the attachments coming closer together during an action um, where the muscle fibers, the actin and myosin in there are linking up and pulling the attachments closer together. You know, yep. So you got a shortening and contracting, a concentric contraction that would be going on. Um, does that, is that, I, mean, I don't want to go too much into it. So <laughs> no, that, that, that's end it there. This is where like, I can just go on and on. <laughs> right, right. Yes. That's, that's, that, when you're that, looking at an that, anatomy right. book, actions right. are going to be the shortening and Correct. contracting of that muscle tissue. Correct. And it's important to note that when an anatomist first or scientists, anatomists first describe these actions, they were looking at cadavers. They, they would just pull on one end of the muscle or tendon and say, what, does, what happens when this muscle shortens? So that's where our, I should say, actions were routinely categorized was through what happens when this origin moves closer to, or the insertion moves closer to the origin. Now, what we've been discussing in the past series of Two Anatomy Geeks that we'll discuss further here is that's not always what happens in everyday life. Because one thing that anatomists looked at looked at was the body when it was basically lying down or just kind of hanging up on, on meat hooks, so to speak. You know, not what, not what happens when the body's actually functioning with the foot on the ground, for example. And that's very important as we look at the foot muscles in particular, because we have to look at not only what happens in the open chain when the foot is off the ground. So plantar flexion is, is a closed chain motion, but it's also an open chain motion or action. But what happens when the foot is on the ground? What, is the, what does that posterior tibia else do specifically when the foot is on the ground and maybe 
it also has an action when the tibia is moving forward, which it does. It also has an action on both ends of its attachments, both up here at the uh, near towards the attachment at the origin, and also what it does here down in the foot as well. So we'll talk about that also. So think about actions that we tend to learn that we've all learned in school are, are sort of isolated functions, but muscles generally don't work that way, even though we'll talk a little bit about that during this session as well. Okay, now let's get into some of the attachments of these muscles. Uh, let me just talk about the foot real quickly. So there's three portions of the foot. We'll go much more into depth in the ankle and foot module when we get to that. But there's basically the hind foot. The hind foot is basically two bones. This is not exactly the three portions of the foot, but, but this just sort of stay with me. The hind foot is basically the heel, the calcaneus, and the talus. So the heel and calcaneus and talus are the hind foot. The midfoot is actually the bones of the, the cuneiforms. So the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms. It's the cuboid bone. It's also the navicular bone. That is your midfoot. Those are the bones of the midfoot. And then the, I should say, hold on, hind foot. Oh, I messed this up. Hold on. All right, all right, here we got started on Two Anatomy Geeks and we're already messed up. Let's go, it's not rear foot, it's forefoot. Let me get, let me do that. I just want to make sure you guys are paying attention. The forefoot are the metatarsals, so the long bones of the foot, as well as the phalanxes, which are the toes, essentially. So the forefoot, again, are the toes and the metatarsals, the long bones of the foot. The midfoot are the cuneiforms, the navicular bone, and the cuboid. Jill will go into the bony anatomy when you sign up for the Two Anatomy Geeks Fall Series. And then calcaneus and talus is the hind foot, makes up the hind foot. Okay. Now we talk about the tripod of the foot. The tripod of the foot is when most of the pressure is underneath the big toe, the small toe, and the heel. This does not mean the rest of the foot is not on the ground. It just means the majority of our weight should be on these three points. If your client has bunions, if your client has flat arches, like true flat arches, we'll talk a little bit about that today and how that relates to plantar fasciitis. They are usually they are, I should say, not usually, they are not on the foot tripod. They have lost mostly the integrity to get that weight directly underneath that big toe and to adequately support their weight through their foot tripod. So weight underneath the ball of the big toe, the ball of the fifth toe, and the ball, I should say, the heel across equal portions of the heel. So when, when we say foot tripod, when we, when we do our exercises here in a little while, we wanna make sure that our weight is mostly across the foot tripod. Now, Jill, if you don't mind, just talk about the plantar fascia. That's gonna be the, our, the majority of our focus today is the plantar fascia. And this is a very important structure, structure that it's very misunderstood. So let's talk about the attachments of the plantar fascia. All right. So um, I'm going to use the screen here first, um, the slide, and then I'm going to go and uh, direct you to me when I'm going to be showing it on um, George Skeleton over here. So plantar fascia, nice brief origin and insertion or brief attachments. Um, as you can see in the picture, it attaches to the calcaneus, which is the heel bone. Um, calcaneus actually is Latin for heel. So that's where they came up with the name for that. Um, it is not attaching like all across the entire calcaneus. It's attaching to a place called the calcaneal tuberosity, which is more towards the front of that calcaneus. And then what it does is it goes out and it expands and it is going to have attachments to the metatarsal heads or what you kind of think about is that ball of the foot is where um, those attachments are. Now I'm going to go to George and you know, I always think like diaphragms, fascial bands, whether it be IT band, the diaphragm itself, the pelvic floor, the bottom of your foot can all be represented so well with a simple piece of saran wrap. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, because that's kind of what it is. So your, um, cal your, your, your plantar fascia is, which sometimes is also called like the, an aponeurosis, but it will originate from right here on the uh, calcaneal tuberosity, right? So right here in this front part of the heel bone. And then like I said, you saw in the picture, it expands out and it is going to have attachments or insertions um, all along those um, heads of the metatarsals. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to stick that there. I'm going to bring this, 
spread it out in a little fan-like look. And there you go. You got yourself some plantar fascia. Now, this is actually going to be superficial, meaning that there's really nothing over it except skin, maybe some adipose tissue, little fat pads. But this lies over all of the muscles that are located, you know, in that plantar surface of the foot. So it's sandwiched between the muscles and the skin. Awesome. Awesome. And it's important to recognize that it actually, you've said this, but just to reiterate, mm -hmm. reiterate it actually blends in actually blends into the tendons of the long toes as well. So mm -hmm. you don't obviously see that on George's foot. He's back there like, yo, what's up with my foot out there? Yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's not just a structure that inserts into the bone, but it's actually connecting to the foot because we'll talk about the function of the plantar fascia here in a moment. So it's important just recognize that it's not attaching directly to the bone per se. It's more attaching and investing itself into the ligaments and the muscles, and I should say the muscles and fascia of the long toes. That's very important for its function in standing, obviously, as well as gait. So let's go back to our presentation, and then we'll talk about just a couple of the muscles that help to control the plantar fascia and the foot, okay? Now, the fascia functions as similar to bridge a bridge or a suspension bridge as well as more of the arch type of bridge and we can think of a, a great illustration of a suspension bridge is the golden gate bridge in san francisco and if you think about the foot the foot's basically being held up by fascial connections all the way up into your head and neck that's why you notice a change when we did our little exercise previously, your foot is acting like a suspension bridge when everything above it is holding it up, so to speak. So that way the plantar fascia and the muscles of the foot don't have to do so much work on their own to support the entire body weight. However, it also functions as a arch. So if you look at the arch, you know, classic bridge, arch bridge, if you look at the, uh, I don't know if you can see my, can you see my arrow in the, on the screen there, Jill? Yes, I can. Oh, perfect. If you see where my arrow's pointing, that sort of pinkish colored brick right there, sort of in the center of the arch, this arch is called sort of the keystone. That's where all the pressure of the bridge over top of it is supported upon specifically that keystone. Well, the plantar fascia, so, so structurally, this will be held together by the weight of the bridge on this keystone, obviously by some cement as well. But if you can think of the cement in between the bricks and the stones, the plantar fascia, I should say the fascia of the foot, basically holds that together as well. The muscles obviously can control and add more stiffness to the foot, but the plantar fascia is what basically holds up the arch and supports the arch of the foot when it's functioning appropriately. So if you think of the two different kinds of bridge, bridges, the suspension bridge and the arch bridge, the foot is basically functioning the same, well, same way. It's structurally supported by the fascia above it as well as the fascial and muscle, the mus musculofascial attachments directly into the foot. So that way you have the, it supports the arches through the suspension function. As Jill described and discussed, it's a fascial diaphragm. It's basically similar, analogous to the pelvic floor, to the respiratory diaphragm, to the fascial diaphragm that's up near our C1, the first bone of our neck. It's also analogous to the fascial diaphragm that's inside our brain. The osteopaths years ago, many years ago, described discuss how all these fascial diaphragms in the brain, C1, the respiratory diaphragm, as well as the pelvic floor, there's a, there's a fascial diaphragm they discuss basically, basically your meniscus of the knee, as well as your, the plantar fascia, they all work as fascial diaphragms. They're all connected. They all help to regulate suspension and pressure within the body. That's why these arches, I should say, the arches of the foot are so important, but the alignment is so important as well. So again, you have the fascial connections that help to lift the foot up and maintain the arches, but you also have that plantar fascia and the fascial connections across the bottom of the, bottom of the foot that help to maintain the three arches, the medial longitudinal arch, the lateral longitudinal arch, as well as the transverse arch of the feet. And it also stiffens the foot for push-off. The plantar fascia is instrumental in stiffening the foot for push-off. Otherwise, you will have to compensate. Here's what I mean by that. So that there's a concept called the windless effect. Windless 
in fact, it comes from sailing. I don't know 100% the reference, the sailors in the group, you know exactly what this means. But essentially what it means is when you flex or extend, I should say, dorsiflex or extend that big toe, the plantar fascia pulls taut underneath the big toe all the way to the heel. So what it does is it raises the arch and it also helps to stiffen the foot so that when you push off your foot, the last thing to leave the ground is essentially the big toe. It creates that rigid platform so that you can push off equally between the big toe, small toe, and maintain the arch and the structure of the foot as you push off so you get maximum propulsion without having to compensate. So this impact is so important. That's why getting that weight on the foot tripod becomes so important. Because think about this. If you don't have good foot tripod, you don't have your weight appropriately underneath that big toe. And now you go into dorsiflexion. You can't appropriately dorsiflex. And that's ultimately where, where bunions come from is a client is, does not have their appropriate weight through their big toe. They start pushing around the big toe instead of through the big toe. And now the client has to compensate. And that's why the plantar fascia, the foot tripod, the entire support above it is so important. That's why we're so stick, we're such sticklers about where the alignment of the foot is as well as the alignment above the body. So what commonly happens is we can irritate the plantar fascia. And if you've ever experienced this issue, you know how painful it can be. Generally speaking, it's when you've rested, when you, after you get up in the morning, after you've been off your foot and the plantar fascia sort of stiffens back down, you stand up those first few steps like, oh my God, that's crazy painful because now the plantar fascia has stiffened down overnight and it can become very stiff and painful when you first start to walk on it. Generally, it's a little easier as you get walking on it. However, those first few steps are quite uncomfortable. So you can have an actual tear in it or you can just have fascial inflammation. Now, we'll talk about, talk about in a moment here why that oftentimes plantar fasciitis actually isn't true plantar fasciitis. It's actually a muscle irritation. We'll talk about that here in a moment. However, it's also because there's imbalances between this superficial and, and the, one of those muscles is the tibialis posterior. So can you just real briefly, and then they'll switch off screen, talk about the posterior tibialis, or tibialis posterior, Jill? Yes, I can. Um... Dr. Rosso, would you like to show, have me show this just directly on George? Uh, we'll, we'll do it as soon as we stop screen share. Okay. All right. So um, the uh, tibialis posterior is a muscle that is deep to the uh, soleus and the gastroc. And when it comes down um, from its origin on the posterior aspect of the tibia and the fibula, it goes around the medial malleolus and it attaches to pretty much every well, all five tarsal bones, and then it also has attachments to the um, uh, metatarsals. So it, it, it has this, this, basically this insertion that's pretty much covering the entire bottom of the foot. It's pretty amazing. We'll show that also here once we stop the screen share. Okay. Another muscle we'll talk about is the abductor hallucis. We'll, we'll go much more in depth into these muscles in the Two Anatomy Geek series, but we'll show you them here in a moment. Now, this is a muscle, if you look at where it attaches to, this is the medial longitudinal arch. So this would be your left foot, an image of the left foot. And if you reach down to your, I'll show, actually I'll show you when we stop screen share. But if you just look at the attachment here, it comes from the inside of the calcaneus or the heel bone. And it runs the entire distance, the arch of the foot, and it inserts into the base of that first phalanx or that first big or the big toe. I'll demonstrate that once we get off screen share. So Jill, if you want to go ahead and show, demonstrate where the tibialis po uh, posterior, the origin of that muscle mm -hmm. is, or the distal, or should say the proximal attachment is. Yes. So your um, tibialis posterior uh, is going to be represented by this uh, pink tape. I love to tape during this. It's kind of what we do. It's our thing. So thing. Um, it is going to originate from the um, proximal posterior aspects of the fibula and the tibia. And then it travels down. Notice we're on the big toe side. That's your medial side of your foot. It travels down. It becomes a tendon and it goes around the backside of that medial malleolus. And by the way, malleolus means little hammer. I guess like mallet. I thought about that one day. Ah, like, yes. like a mallet. Okay. So that's yes, where they, yes. they thought it looked like a little mallet. And so then it comes down as a tendon and then it goes down underneath. 
Uh -huh. And it is going to have insertions on that. And Dr. Osar is going to show you, he's got a bigger foot and his, his foot has more mobility to it, which is nice. Um, it's going to come down here and insert onto five of the uh, tarsal bones. So your cuneiform, the, um, uh, the uh, oh my gosh, I always forget those guys, the, um, I'm having a brain issue. All, all the three all three cuneiforms. cuneiforms. Cuboid, that's it. The cuboid, cuboid yep. all three of the cuneiforms. Um, it's going to come down and have um, an attachment along that base of the, uh, the metatarsals. So it's, as I, it was hard when I was putting it in here because I'm like, I'm trying to like get it fanned yeah, out sure, so you can sure, see sure. all the different attachments that it has underneath that bottom of the foot. Awesome. You kind of get a sense of like where all those little blue marks are. So, so here's your... Yeah your medial cuneiform right here. That's where the attachment is. Oh, oh, actually yours looks better. Actually, yes. So you can see all the blue dots where on Jill's model on George there. It basically is attaching, fascially blending into all those different bones. Now, why is it attaching to all those different bones? Because what it needs to do is, is collect and gather those bones to stiffen those bones so that when we push off, remember that windless effect, so that when we push off, that big toe, that th that foot is rigid and solid so that when we push off, it's put, you're pushing off a rigid lever. And that's, again, why it's important to have the integrity of the entire system above it by why, what, why we need that tr foot tripod and that pressure directly underneath the big toe so that you can use this fascial, this mild fascial connection between the tibialis posterior, between the plantar fascia, use all the structures on the bottom of the foot appropriately because when you don't here's the other muscle good and that's good thank you Joel is remember that abductor houses comes from the inside of the heel here and it traverses the medial longitudinal arch to the base of that first phalanx right here so that muscle basically abducts which means it does this to the bottom of the foot the, or I should say the big toe however it also helps to maintain the integrity of that arch so that when we push off, when we stand, obviously, but also when we push off, the arch is maintained. Now, a lot of clients, so you actually feel this on your own foot. So grab your own foot. So cross your leg over. Let me see if I can get down here. There we go. Let's get down here. So if you actually cross your foot, uh, not, don't cross your foot, cross your knee, and feel your foot here on the inside of the heel. So go right inside that heel bone. And I love those, those Latin terminology that, you know, like the little hammer. I'm like, oh, I'm always learning something. Um, come in here to your heel and push right there. That's the attachment of your abductor halysis. Now, what's interesting about this muscle is not only does it support the arch, but a lot of times when people say, oh, I have plantar fasciitis, this is exactly where it's super tender. This is where they have the pain, not here where the plantar fascia attaches, but right here where the abductor hallucis muscle attaches to. And that's what's so important about understanding anatomy is that's actually a tendinopathy that they're experiencing and not plantar fasciitis. And even doctors, you know, podiatrists, chiropractors, medical doctors in correctly diagnosis as plantar fasciitis when it's not, it's a tendinopathy of the big toe. But what's interesting is what bothers the big, this big toe muscle, the abductor halysis, is also similar to what irritates the plantar fascia. It's not optimal alignment and control through the bottom of the foot. Now, understanding that, let's find out what do we do about this muscle, I should say this fascial connection. So one of the things, obviously, you, you want to work some of these muscles, posterior tibialis being an example of that, posterior tibialis, remember, is going around the, the back of the, between the tibia and fibula and the interosseous membrane underneath the medial malleolus or around the medial malleolus to the bottom of the foot. So one thing you can do is, let me show you, let me see if I can just back up here a moment, is you can get your ball, this, you do this lying down, but we'll do it right here just because it's easy for you guys to see, is put that ball you'd lie down and put that ball right directly, not behind the knee, because you have blood vessels and nerves that you, you don't want to push there, but right behind and in between the tibia and fibula and get deep there. And you want to relax the tibia, should say the gastric and soleus, so that you can actually get up there and go deeper. I wouldn't do it the way I'm doing it here. I'm just showing you just for demonstration, demonstration purposes. So essentially, if I turn around here, get my, my foot, it's basically right there in between my tibia and fibula, and it's 
deep to gastric soleus, that's why you need sort of a small ball like that works really well to get up in there. And basically you would just push in there and kind of roll down this direction. So I'd be lying down, I put my leg up on a chair or coffee table, roll down, and then work that muscle in several different locations. Now I'd go slow and deliberate, but this is the direction and this is where I'd get that muscle. You can also catch that muscle, let me switch legs here. You can also catch that muscle here, like right along the, so here's your tibia, that flat bone or shin bone. If you go right here along your tibia, just kind of push on that muscle right there, that area right there, you can get that muscle also right there. You can put the ball in there and kind of roll and rub that right through there, okay? Now, keep, actually do that with a ball. Take your ball and, actually, before we do that, let's do a quick little assessment. Let's go back to your, your feet. Let's find that tighter of the two sides, okay? So for me, remember, my, side, my tighter of my two sides is my left side. So it's a little, I'm on the outside of my foot. I don't have good pressure underneath my big toe. And the pressure is more on, yeah, that fifth digit on the outside of my heel bone or calcaneus. So let's work that posterior tibialis. And again, this is not exactly how I'd work it, but let's just go through this little process. So I'll put my foot up here. And basically what I'm going to do again is I'm gonna put that ball underneath and just kind of roll. It's a little bit faster than we'd, we'd go. We'd work it down, 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 down. So get, getting through the gastroc and soleus, so keep the gastroc and soleus relaxed. Work it down. And now bring it out here to the front, or I should say the side, that medial aspect. And this is where a lot of your clients will get things like shin splints, medial tibial stress syndrome. It's a plant, I should say it's a posterior tibialis running down this direction where they start to feel that, oh yeah, I get this pain in here when I run. So again, just kind of work that muscle there. Work that muscle there. Work that muscle there. All the way down to that medial malleolus or the little hammer there. So that inside bone right there. Now, let's bring it down to the floor. So I'm gonna pop off my headphones. I'm gonna get down here on the floor and I'll bring you guys down here with me so you guys can see what I'm doing down here. Why, well, this is the one time, remember I said we don't really teach our clients or have our clients just roly poly, you know, just randomly just roll their foot. But this is one time where it'll look like I'm doing that. So let me just get you down here a little bit lower. So put your ball down, get behind. So I'm gonna get behind, let me get behind the metatarsal heads, all right, underneath. The only area I don't, I don't want you to rub directly underneath is right underneath that big toe. You have two sesamoid bones there. Don't roll underneath the big toe in this situation, okay? Because you don't wanna irritate those sesamoid bones, especially in your clients that have painful bunions or sesamoiditis. So again, just rolling the foot side to side across the ball, just mobilizing those foots, those foots, those toes, and the joints of the digits number two through four. And now let's work that plantar fascia. So now my heel will go on the ball like this. And now I'll just I'll do a little bit of rolling underneath the attachment of the plantar fascia, and then under the attachment of the plantar fascia in the midfoot. So I'll go forward and back. And again, go kind of slow. You don't need to don't don't just do this. Go kind of slow, so you get all aspects of it, and then go across, side to side. So now we're working across, side to side, and my cat wants to say that she likes to do this as well. So hopefully she won't meow the entire time. But again, just kind of work that plantar fascia side to side. You're basically just mobilizing it and mobilizing the foot as well, waking the foot up, so to speak, okay? Now, we've just done a little bit of work. Now let's stand up, recheck the weight underneath your feet. So now I'll put my weights back down. And now, ah, the foot actually feels a lot better. I can actually get my weight underneath my big toe now. It feels a lot more controlled. I have a little bit more weight on the inside of my heel. Much different sensation. Hopefully you guys felt the same sensation, like a little bit different. So now let's talk about squatting and knee pain because a lot of our clients have knee pain that's also related to what's happening at their foot. So think about this now. Most of us have been taught Regardless of where you train, whether you train as a chiropractor, physical therapist, massage therapist, trainer, when you, when you squat, you want to keep the weight back here. The knees don't go over the toes. So you 
We've been taught to push the hips back and keep those nose, the knees behind the toes. But I want you to feel what happens when you do that. So find your feet, find your foot tripod. So big toe, get your weight underneath your big toe. So I'll do it from this side first. Get your weight on the inside of your big toe and your heel. Okay, so inside first, and then keep it down, and then put your small toe down. Digit number five, keep the foot tripod. Big toe, small toe, heel. Same thing on the other side, big toe, inside of heel, then put down the small toe, maintain that foot tripod. Now, do this with me. This is important, you feel this and experience this. So now, squat with your, your knees behind your toes and your hips going back. Drive the hips back like we've all been taught to do. And what do you feel happen underneath your feet as you do that? You feel the weight go where? So put it in the chat box as you do this. Where do you feel the weights go as you do your squat in this manner? So Jill, what do we got? What are people heel. saying? Heel, yes. Mary heel. came up, she said there heel. You. Heels, yep, Patty is saying, she feels in heels. Yes, and we've all been taught, I should say most of us have been taught, hey, that's where you want your weights, back in the heels. But here's the problem with that. When you squat, let me bring it back here. So, kind of pay, so just hold on just for a minute. Stay where you are, but just kind of watch the screen now. When we squat, we should have, we need to have specific things happen at the foot. What we need to have happen at the foot is when you squat, your tibia should come forward so that if you can actually see my foot here, not my, my model of the foot, when the tibia comes forward, when you squat, it does what to the arches of the foot. It helps to elongate the foot. It helps to widen the foot and it allows the arches to slowly drop down so that you eccentrically load the muscles as well as the fascia and allow the foot to adapt to the ground. What you felt happening is when you kept the tibia vertical that you did not get that reaction. You kept your foot in this position and many of you actually the foot, the arch actually got higher. So what happens for a lot of your clients, or I should say what happens is you're not loading the foot appropriately. You're not loading the lower extremity appropriately. So why did we all learn that we should keep the knees back? This is exactly why, let me show you now. If you've been on any of our Two Anatomy Geek series, you get this, especially the hip series, you know why that you don't wanna put the hip, the, you know why people have taught us to put the hips back, but basically, let me get you up here just a little bit higher. What happened for a lot of our clients is when they squat, they come in, they squat like this. They squat and their knees go forward. So I go, oh, that hurts my knees, okay? So what they did, the industry did was, hey, just put your hips back. Oh yeah, that, that doesn't hurt my knees. But the problem is, that's not the problem. The problem was not getting anterior pelvic rotation so that your hips could be, your posterior hips could be loaded, but you can still keep the knee where it needs to be over the toes to allow the foot to go through its normal mechanics. So now do this with me again. So get your foot tripod, big toe, small toe, heel, both sides. Now stay long, put your hands on your pelvis. The first motion is not pushing your hips back. The first motion is anterior pelvic rotation. Anterior pelvic rotation, that allows you to load the hips and allows your knee to come forward, allows it, the foot to spread out, get wider, and remain upon the foot tripod. So now tell me in the chat box, where do you feel the weight on your foot when you do your squat in this manner? Jill, what do we got? Type that in. I'm keeping an eye. Say again? I'm keeping an eye on it. Let's see. Okay. They're probably still doing it, feeling that foot <laughs> tripod. I've got uh, Tina saying shifts to the arch. Karen. Just the arch, the foot tripod, tripod. bouncing the whole foot. Yep, Absolutely. More bounce. Yep, yep. Absolutely. So that's the importance of understanding anatomy, biomechanics, and even motor control, how the brain controls the movement so that you're training your client the appropriate manner. Now, what about those clients that you're like, hey, but they do have knee pain when they squat? Well, some clients, you may need to keep their knees back because their knees are so shot. They're so degenerated from not using these, these mechanics appropriately, mostly the anterior pelvic rotation. 
But the reason why I had you go through this experience is, but what are you compromising to make that happen? If you take a client, an individual away from optimal mechanics, which is what we just did when you put the book, when you move the tibias back, when you take them out of optimal mechanics, the client has to compensate. What's one easy way for the client to compensate is through their foot, right? Move the foot back. And then their feet can become either, either people with rigid feet like mine, they'll become more rigid, or people that have hypermobile feet, their feet will just collapse down even further. So you have to weigh the options. Is it worth what your client is compensating or how your client is compensating just to do a squat? Or are there better positions or patterns you can use with your client until you get them being able to squat in a better position? Or maybe squatting just isn't a great pattern for them because it will start to alter their mechanics. So let me just finish up because like I said, we're supposed to be 30 minutes, but here we are at <laughs> almost an hour. <laughs> we kind of knew that was going to happen, but, but it's really important that we, we get these concepts across to you that you understand that we're just not making this stuff up because we like to hear ourselves talk, even though we love to hear ourselves talk. <laughs> it's more important that, that you're able to apply this information to your clients to understand why we teach the things we teach so that you can help your clients who aren't getting this information from other places. So again, you must, when you ask a question or try to answer a question, knees behind the toes or not, it has to be based upon your understanding of anatomy, biomechanics, and your client, not just the industry legends that have been taught. So ideally, I want my client right here in the image to the left, not the image to the right. Again, it doesn't mean you can't do a split squat in this position. There's nothing wrong with that, but just understand that ideally we want our client to get more close to where Melissa is in this left image versus the right image. So recap, we talked about the foot tripod, why that's so important to big toe function and to plantar fascia function. Jill, you wanna talk, talk about the plantar fascia? Just recap us. Yes, hang on, I'm just answering things. Hi, so with the plantar fascia, um, you know, we said it's this, it's this connective tissue. It's not a muscle, you know, it's not technically moving anything like the muscles, like we think about that affect the ankle, like your soleus and your gastroc. And we talked about posterior tibialis and anterior tibialis. We'll talk about during the webinar series as well. Um, but you know, it's so important because it acts as that, that support system for that bottom of the foot and not just one part of the foot, but all the arches together. And so how important is and how when it's not working well and it becomes injured, you know, the things that can, it can take an athlete out of, of a game, like a professional athlete out for, you know, weeks, weeks. I know Peyton Manning was one of the people I was thinking about when you're talking about mm -hmm. how painful it can be. Yes, I remember when he had issues, you know, with his plantar fascia, he, and even like the, 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 the people that are watching the game, the announcers were like, something's wrong with this game. Something's off with Peyton Manning. <laughs> That's right. And then they, they, later on we find out, Oh, he had done some major damage to his plantar fascia during and before that game. So yep. yeah. Yep. Huge. We talked about the corrective exercise of just basically releasing the posterior tibialis muscle, such as the posterior tibialis, also stimulating or mobilizing that foot with the ball, that's also a release, but it's also an activation because you're changing the proprioceptive input into the bottom of the foot. So it's actually also waking up the fascial connections to the muscles, as well as mobilizing the foot so that the brain's like, hey, I know where that foot is. I can find the foot tripod in a little bit better manner now. And then integrating it into a functional exercise a squat pattern. So you teach a client how to use their foot appropriately and deciding if a squat pattern is even right for your client or maybe something like a hip hinge may be more appropriate or how you teach your client to do the squat. Maybe they do a ball supported squat. Maybe they just do a split squat. Maybe they use a split stance hip hinge or a carry pattern. Maybe some of these patterns are more effective for our clients because squats just disrupt their mechanics so much and actually don't help them improve. And that's the beauty of understanding anatomy. Now, hopefully you've learned a lot in this tutorial and you're gonna learn even more in our series. I mean, Jill and I created a brand new series on the foot and ankle coming up in just a couple weeks. I believe it's maybe two weeks, maybe, maybe even be a week or so. It's gonna be on Saturdays, I believe coming in the fall. And then we have another one coming on Mondays in the, right after that. So basically we're gonna cover the anatomy, 
biomechanics and motor control of the ankle and foot complex because they work together. We're gonna to share with you how to use this information, your anatomy, and apply it to common conditions. Common conditions like ankle sprains, Achilles tendinopathy, bunions, neuromas, arch issues, whether your client has flat and or rigid feet, shoes, and how to choose whether your client should wear orthotics. Not that you're gonna diagnose your client or take them out of their orthotics, but, but what do you wanna help your client, educate your client on regarding their orthotics and their shoes? And if you heard my story in chiropractic school, we all got our orthotics. And I never had knee pain until I started using orthotics. We'll talk about that and how that impacts your ankle and foot, how that impacts areas higher up, including the knees. So the ankle and foot series is a four part series. It's four hours of usable information. It's one hour series, usually nine to 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. However, we do record these, and as you notice, we generally go over the time just because we love to get this information out and make sure that we answer all your questions, which we'll take here in a few moments. Recordings, we give you access to all the recordings of the session, so that way you can go back and review if you cannot be on live. And also, when the series is over, like if you're interested in purchasing the hip and core, we already have gotten CECs for those recordings. However, we have to wait till the entire season series is over before we can apply because so we need to send them the recordings and the handouts. So the series is, it'll be how many? Uh, actually it'll be for 2021. It won't be this year's. Um, 2021 will be the CCs for next, going next year. So if you need CCs for next year, the other two ser series are already approved for CCs for this year. So that's, that would be the core and the hip. So again, $49, four hours, generally it'll be, it'll be closer to five to six hours of information. You get the recordings, you get the PDF handouts, you also get the CECs once the recordings and once the CECs for 2021. Jill is also gonna do a bonus training for you guys so that way you understand the bony anatomy so that when we talk about different areas of the foot and or knee, when, when we get to the knee, that you also understand what the bony anatomy is of the foot. Do you wanna talk about that real quick, Jill? Yes, um, I am actually going to be creating that uh, today. And what I do is if you've been part of our webinar series in the past, um, we found that people sometimes have questions about where are the attachments that we're talking about during our webinar series. So we said, you know, what would be great is to give them like an overview, a reminder of where some of these bony landmarks are, like the cuboid, like the cuneiforms, the tarsals, or the um, um, talus, the calcaneus. What are we talking about when we say the um, base of the metatarsals? Um, those types of things where you know you know it, but you may not remember exactly where it is. So we found it just sort of helps. Um, and people really enjoy just getting a real, and I, I use, I use the tape during the video. I, I've got um, a lovely skeleton here who has been so helpful to me. He's like my friend during this time when I've, you know, been, been here in my apartment alone. <laughs> when he's like, we're really close. Sometimes like, oh man. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna use all that. It'll be great. And whatever we're talking about um, for that webinar series, I will have created like the specific bony landmarks for that, that we're gonna be using. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's cool is our friends, the, you know, George there, this is his favorite time of the year. This is Halloween's coming up. So yeah, see, Jill will talk about the structure the landmarks and the orientation. So that way it makes it easier to learn anatomy. So we've got the ankle and foot coming up in the next series for weekends of that for obsessions of that for modules. And then we also have the knee series right after that. They're $49 each for right now. You can get them both for $65 for both series. And like I said, CCs will be for 2021. So we'll apply for those. So you'll, you'll have access to the CCs for next year, plus the bonus tutorials that Jill will create for you. So hopefully you've learned a lot in this free training and you're going to learn a ton more about ankle and foot issues in this series of Two Anatomy Geeks and the upcoming series on the knee. We'll talk a lot about the muscles around the knee, as well as how to train appropriately those lower extremity patterns for clients that do have knee problems. Again, because the knee and ankle and foot work intimately together. So it's important that we have all this information to help create the best strategy for your clients. Now, of course, like we talked about, we always go over. Thank you, thank you for everybody that, that's stuck with us, whether you're on Facebook Live, whether you're here. Uh, Mary just posted the link to purchase it. So $65 for two series, $49 each series individual. So 
Jill, have we gotten any questions? Let's take a few moments. We have, we have. Um, All right, great. I'm going to uh, throw out the first one. This is from Jacqueline, and she just asked, what happens if you uh, do not squat correctly? Yeah, when you think about the, those clients, that when they're squatting with their knees so far behind their toes, you're actually reinforcing non-optimal mechanics. And that's ultimately what drives a lot of your clients' issues is because they're putting their weight back, which is basically lifting their arches up. So you're teaching the nervous system – there's a, there's a great concept, Hebb's law, is neurons that fire together, wire together. So what you're doing is you're teaching, thanks Patricia, you're teaching the nervous system that when you load into a squat pattern or bend pattern, you're teaching the arch to actually lift up, which is the exact opposite what you want the client to, do, to be doing. So if your client has an area of their foot, which we'll talk about in the series, that's rigid, and it's important that you, you assess your client for that, then you're just reinforcing the rigid rigidity or stiffness of that area of the foot. And that's what a lot of times why your client is compensating because they're doing the exact opposite motion that they should be doing. So it just reinforces the habits that they already have. And that's why a lot of your clients will start to develop bunions or neuromas and some of these other issues because they're not using the optimal alignment and biomechanics to, to load the foot appropriately. So great question. Thanks for asking that. All right. Uh, thanks, Mary, uh, thanks, Jacqueline. And um, George has a question. George said, uh, what is Dr. Osar's optimal footwear recommendations, please? And she said, look forward to the course. I awesome. can answer by saying I know what Dr. Osar's non-optimal recommendations <laughs> are because I know it when I walk in the office and he looks at my feet and then rolls his eyes, but I won't go into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, trendy footwear usually is not trendy footwear like Jill wears and many of our clients wear are not, is not optimal because if you, if you look at your shoe, basically what you want to do, and this comes from my buddy who's a podiatrist. He's one of the few podiatrists that I've, we work with that I'm like, wow, this guy really gets it. So basically if you look at the bottom of your foot, your foot is wider at the base, uh, I should say around the toes. The toe portion of the foot is wider than the, let me put this down a little bit. So, so my wife's like, dude, you're not that flexible, but <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be that flexible for you guys. So the, 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 this portion of the foot is wider than the heel and that's how your foot should be designed. That's the natural design of the foot. But what happens with your short, your, your, your sort of trendy shoes is they tend to be narrower at the top. So they pinch your foot this direction. So they basically turn your foot into what should be a tripod, wider up here, narrower in the base, and they turn it into basically almost a rectangle. And that's where you can see a lot of clients' feet that come into our office that with foot problems. They, their foot looks basically straight up and down. That's not how the foot should be designed. The heel should be narrower than the, the forefoot around the, the toes because it should be a tripod. So... The footwear, and I know, George, George, that was not your question, <laughs> but, but here's why the, the footwear is so important. So foot, the footwear that you want to decide, there's two companies that, that create the appropriate footwear. There, there's probably more, but these are the two ones that come to mind is Ultras, a, Ultras, A-L-T-R-A. So my friend, Golden Harper, he's the founder of that company. He's a crazy fast marathoner. So Ultras, A-L-T-R-A, as well as LEMS, L-E-M-S. They also create the footwear that's appropriate to getting your foot in the foot tripod and allowing your foot to spread out. Because again, when, you, when your foot hits the ground, you need that foot to get longer and wider. When you squat, you need the foot to get longer and wider. And those narrow toes, toe base or shoe base does not allow your foot to do that. Oh, question on Facebook. Oh, great question, Annie. Thank you for that question. That's a great question because that question always comes up. Should I work with my clients in bare feet or shoes? And, you know, people hate this answer, but it really depends. I, we like to work with our clients always in bare feet because even our clients with diabetic neuropathy, so that they can't really, the client can't really feel their bottom of their feet or peripheral neuropathy from spinal stenosis where they can't feel their feet. What will happen is they don't have great sensations. So their feet will be in shoes but, but you kind of want to get the foot out of shoes so that way you can mobilize the foot and get the foot to really 
because the, the nervous system knows that the foot is still there. So this will allow the foot to kind of manipul be man manipulated and allow the nervous system to sense the different motions of the foot, even though the client can't feel the bottom of their feet. So we do like bare feet. Now, what about clients that actually have painful feet and they're in orthotics? Well, they, you may want to keep them in their shoes when they're going through the painful cycle. Or if, if you know that their foot gets irritated, the client says to you, hey, you know, my, my walking, around, walking around in bare feet always hurts my feet. You, you, you have to be a little careful with that client. I will still take, we will still take those clients out of their shoes because we want them to experience what their foot is like. You want to see what their foot is like. Some of your older clients, it, it could be a process to get them out of their shoes, do some barefoot work, get them back into their shoes, and then get them into their workout, which I would, we always try to do. We always recommend doing that, but it can be a little bit of process depending on how much time you have with your client. So if you have real short sessions, you may want to just keep your clients in their shoes, but still teach them the concepts of big toe, small toe, heel, which is another reason why we want our clients out of their shoes. But again, just work with what you have and just be cognizant of your clients that actually have pain or been told not to go barefoot specifically by the doctor or podiatrist for a specific condition. Cool. Anything else, Jill? Uh, or, or Janice? Yeah. Uh, it looks like, uh, what about the vibrant? Yeah, they actually can kind of, you know, the, que the, the, the question, <laughs> I'm getting there. Holy cow. <laughs> the question was the Vibram five finger shoes, you know, the, the, you put your toes in, they were real popular for a while and they've been sort of fallen out of vogue. And I think probably because they're hard to get into and, and after you wear them a while, they smell real bad and, and it's, it's hard to like get them smelling clean again. So and now that more companies have come out with wider shoe based shoes that now people, people use those. But again, I, I do like the Vibrams. I do like the five fingers. I still, I still have a pair. I don't wear them as much, again, just, just for, that, for, that per, for that reason. But, it, but they are great also to get that idea of allowing the foot to move, getting the foot a tripod, getting the foot more reactive to the ground, for sure. Awesome. All right. Uh, you, would you like one from my end over here, Dr. Yeah, let's do, let's do one more. Okay. Um, uh, Lynn asked this question, and I think she is CRPS. So I think she's talking about complex regional pain syndrome. Yes. Post bunionectomy. Any mm. quick general suggestions? Dry needling has been helping. Yeah. So again, that that's that's one of those complex situations, complex mm. regional pain syndrome, which often happens when you've had a trauma or surgery being a trauma, right? Sometimes you need surgery. I'm not saying surgery isn't always a necessary trauma, but it's still a trauma to the body, which is why oftentimes your, your nervous system will go into hyperreaction. So, that, so you get the complex regional pain syndrome. So dry needling can be very effective at mitigating some of that nervous system reaction. Improving mechanics can also, we've also been shown, or I should say has been shown, for example, my, my colleague that I told you about, Dr. Ray McClanahan, who's, who created Correct Toes, he actually showed in a study, he's actually taking a hiatus right now doing, writing up some research that he, they did a study. I don't know if he did it, but someone did a study where they looked at blood flow to the, to the feet. And when the toes were compressed like that, the blood flow was, I believe, 30% decreased compared to when the foot was more like that. So again, aligning that foot can change the ner ner nerve innervation to the foot as well as the blood flow to the foot which may have an effect. I'm not saying 100% it will, but it may have an effect also on some of these regional pain syndrome issues that clients are having. But again, remember that's also that's, that's a that's systemic reaction. So things like breathing will also help with some of those conditions as well. So do all the things, you know, usually what I tell my clients, we're going to do everything we, we know how to do. Better alignment, better control, better breathing, better suspension, and see if we can have an impact versus saying to the client, we never tell the client, yeah, we're, we're gonna help you with that. We're gonna fix that problem. No, we're gonna see if we can create a better nervous system reaction, improve parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system reaction, and then help give you a better strategy for life. So we, Jill and I, and Janice and Mary, we wanna thank you guys so much for being on, for, for spending your, your Saturday morning with us. We look forward to joining you in the Two Anatomy Geek series. The link is in the chat box. If you miss it, help desk at fitness education seminars. If you need any specific questions answered, um, just reach out to Mary that way. And the sign up link is also in the chat box. Well, again, we loved having you. Love being back with you, Jill. High five. Love being back with you guys. You too. And, and, and the boss over there in the corner. And the, and, and the boss over there.
Can't wait to see you guys on the brand new series, Ankle and Foot, coming up here in just a couple weeks. Four modules on that, and then we'll follow up with four modules on the knee. After you take these modules, you'll have so many strategies to, you'll understand the foot and ankle better. You'll understand the knee better. You'll be able to also apply, again, like I said, it's important for us to, to make sure that you apply this information to your clients. Happy Saturday. Happy fall, wherever you are. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Virtual high five to everybody. Go out there and change One, lives. Two, three. Boo! <laughs> <laughs>